Well, there is actually going to be a horse race in Chicago as the St. Thomas Alumni Pipe Band and the City of Dunedin Pipe Band face each other in grade one competition. This is great for the Chicago games, but it's still bad for the grade one landscape as a whole. And I will tell you why. From Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, we are live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to show number three of Live at PBL TV. I'm Renee Goche, and if you like what you're watching, please hit that like button and subscribe to this channel. Well, <laughs> I survived my first uh, St. Patrick's Day parade in Toronto, and it was a challenge in itself, being the longest parade I ever did, and having to deal, deal with the potholes and then even pavement along Young Street. I was bass drumming for the St. Andrews Pipes and Drums of Mississauga, a band that I have an indirect relationship in ways too complex to describe in the time I have to do the monologue. And what can I say? I have to get some work done to strengthen my back, which was uh, a casualty in this event. I registered nine kilometers of walking before I even got home. And that was casual walking from Toronto City Hall to get on a subway to St. George Station, walking down a few blocks to get to a building to warm up before, before I started even marching back up that road, up to Bloor, down Bloor, and back in, and right into that Young Street wind tunnel. And there was at least two kilometers of marching into that wind tunnel, fighting the bass drum to stay in one position. And, you know, people with back issues know the challenges of carrying some weight, even while negotiating with uneven pavement. But in the end, I overcame the challenge. Will I do this again? I'm not sure yet. We can be sure of is that we can start the show with the latest news. The City of Dunedin and St. Thomas Alumni Pipe Bands will meet in the field of competition in the Windy City. The Chicago Highland Games, the only competition rivaling the North American Championships at the Glen Gary Highland Games, will be hosting two type, top pipe bands in the United States. And this will not be the first time the Grade 1 bands will compete this season it, to take place on June 17th. That's because the city of Dunedin further confirmed that they will be in Georgetown as the Ontario championship season begins. They will be challenging the 78 Fraser Highlanders in their own backyard at the Georgetown fairgrounds on June 10th. We will continue following these bands and other grade one bands as we go down the road to Glasgow green in August. The lineup for the Melbourne Highland games has been set as the tour in the Australian state of Victoria begins. The PBV has listed the bands competing, which include the grade, the New Zealand Grade 2 champions Hawthorne and the 4A division champion Scotch College. When it is all said and done, you can tune in here for the results show this coming weekend as the PBV tour goes full swing. If there is one thing that will be missed on the Glasgow Green this August, it will be the Highland Dancing comp Competition, which coincides with many of these competitions. Pipes Drums Magazine has reported that the RSPBA has canceled the RSPBA Highland Dance Competition, citing budgetary restrictions, despite it only covering a small per percentage in overall expenditures at the Worlds in Glasgow. There have been no responses from the organizing officials to the magazine's inquiries for comment at this time. A hat tip and a thanks to Andrew Burdoff for covering this. And now we go to our guest who so happens to be in a town just south of this city. He has been regarded as one of the top 
midsection drummers in Atlantic Canada and Ontario. He has played on bands that won the North American Championship, and he has even played in Scotland. He is a registered adjudicator in the PBBSO in Ontario, judging tenor and bass drumming. He is a drumming instructor in the art of bass and tenor and drum kit, and we are pleased to have him on the show. He is none other than Big Johnny Rowe. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me. Thanks for windy. coming. <laughs> I was going to say wind, Windy City. Windy City. Say that five times fast. <laughs> right? They're going to have, they're going to find me on the Howard Stern show for some reason or other. <laughs> <laughs> you caught it though. You caught it. I was impressed. Uh, I caught, caught Yes, it. I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure uh, <laughs> at some point I'm going to find myself on the Howard Stern show it, all of a sudden. It happens. It happens. We've, we've, I'm sure many of us <laughs> have heard it before. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, first of all, let's talk about how you started. You started at a very early age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess I kind of started, um, I, you know, you start when you start, I guess. Um, and uh, it seems to me like a lot of people that seem to uh, you know, excel at uh, certain things, usually take an interest in things fairly early. It's not always the case, of course, but um, for me, I, I started um, getting into drumming. I had an interest, uh, you know, pretty much as long as I can remember, just something about banging on things uh, really appealed to me and, um, uh, you know, banging on the pots and pans at home and, and eventually got to a point where, I really wanted to uh, pursue, you know, actually taking some type of instruction and bothering my my parents at the, you know, uh, any chance I could get to to want to be a drummer. I want to be the dr a drummer. I want to take drum lessons. And um, I dare say, probably for a lot of parents out there <laughs> or caregivers, it's uh, it's not the easiest instrument. I don't think there are any easy instruments. Maybe maybe a you know the harmonica or something like that. Um, but uh, there's a lot of instruments that are difficult uh, volume wise for a lot of parents to kind of deal with getting into. And um, anyway, long story short, I yeah. broke them down enough after taking ukulele lessons and recorder and all that kind of jazz. And uh, eventually, um, you know, uh, kind of got into drumming and it was really actually my dad's um, idea. Um, it kind of happened by accident more than by design, just kind of, we heard a local, uh band was looking for new players at that time it was the dartmouth boys pipe and drum band uh, this would have been probably around 1980 or so and mm -hmm. uh, i would have been about eight eight or nine i guess um and um yeah and uh you know they were they were it was that just happened to be that time of year where they were looking for you know, like their kind of new recruits you know their new teaching program was kicking in and looking for new people to come out to start learning chanter or uh, or or drum pad and um and my old man basically just said why don't you try that you know and ch try that out for a bit and if it takes you know maybe we can revisit doing this drum kit thing and and you'll be on your way to being uh, neil peart and uh you know uh, the next neil peart and that that's that's that <laughs> well you know long i think all of us drummers are always have our uh, i mean i've I've always loved Neil Peart. I've always loved uh, John Bonham and Keith mm -hmm. Moon. I mean, uh, I don't think there's a single drummer around that does not give, um, pay homage to all the great drummers. Even if it, even if we are playing in a pipe band, we we'd well, still love drums. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with you. I think certainly if you're from a, a certain vintage and, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm an eighties, I'm an eight product of the eighties. I'm an eighties kid. So I grew up, you know, when there was still very much, um, a lot of live music going on. I mean, it's still out there obviously, but you know, we've gone through the whole kind of electronic phase and things like that. And, you know, I guess one of the, the be beautiful things about music is that it's always constantly evolving, but certainly uh, being a product of uh, the eighties and having uh, older siblings who are you know, listening to a lot of bar rock bands and, you know, hair, hair metal bands and things like that. And, you know, the big teased hair and the long bangs and stuff like that, crusty bangs and everything. Um, 
you know, I grew up listening to a lot of kind of, uh, you know, rock and roll and a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, that kind of thing. So that style of music really lends itself to loud, heavy, thunderous, you know, girthy sounding drums. You know, that's just the nature of that kind of music, that hard rock and, and that kind of thing, Zeppelin and, uh, you know, a lot of the heavy metal bands at the time. And so that's kind of how I got, I don't, for whatever reason, you know, maybe I just uh, really, because I already had an interest in, in drums, uh, all things percussive and just kind of naturally kind of followed into that path of interesting or, you know, getting an interest in that type of music. And, and then anyway, uh, you know, so we joined the the pipe band and uh, I, I thought if that was my ticket to eventually getting a drum set, then I'm all in. And, um, you know, I honestly didn't even really blink, you know, blink. And it was just like, okay, let's go. Um, and uh, I remember my, my dad kind of filed me off on the whatever night it was that we were registering for lessons. And it was like, okay, do you want to learn how to play the pipes too and try the chanter i guess it's called or do you want to just do the drums and i was like just the drums and that was it was just like nope just drums that's it and uh and <laughs> the rest as they say is history you know a couple of years later i got my first drum set and uh here i am still doing both still very much involved in both worlds so uh yeah there it is you know the ukulele and the recorder got ditched officially for the drum set so there we go <laughs> So how much, so you came from Nova Scotia, correct? Yeah, that's right. I grew up in, uh, in Dartmouth. Um, I, we moved there when I was still quite young. Um, my, uh, my folks uh, relocated back to Nova Scotia. My dad originally grew up in Sydney and then Sydney, Cape Breton, and then later Halifax. Uh, and my mother is actually uh, born and partially raised in Puerto Rico. Um, and um and then uh her her father um was in the banking uh business and uh he they basically spent part time back and forth between puerto rico and lunenburg nova scotia so so um yeah so it was always kind of in the plans uh of my folks to eventually settle back down in nova scotia and and you know they spent a lot of time traveling the world and working internationally um while my older siblings uh were still quite young long before i came on the scene and um so i was actually born abroad i was actually born in hong kong and then uh we moved to montreal for a short time after that and then back to nova scotia so we i was about four years old four and a half when we came back to dartmouth and uh that's you know essentially that's home that's where i grew up and um you know did all my schooling and whatnot so uh yeah yeah it's a great great spot i miss it dearly but uh you know ontario is where i'm at well that sort of explains why you don't have that down home accent <laughs> It's funny. A lot of people actually mention that, and maybe it's just one of those things um, that uh, uh, I I don't know. I, I you know I, I'm sure I could probably turn it on, and I'm sure I slip back into a little bit of it when I'm you know when I'm back home and around certain people, as oftentimes people you know tends to happen when they visit you know back back home, bud. You know, like uh, and uh, probably at some point probably do sound like I'm from the Trailer Park Boys or something like that. Um, and uh and whatnot no, but not uh, at all you said you sound like you, know, you sound like you're from ontario yeah well I mean, you sound very much like you're from ontario <laughs> maybe it was just being around a lot of ontarians um when i was in university and uh and uh, you know i've always ha had the had the good fortune of being able to travel a lot and um mm -hmm. i think i'm a good i think i'm a good observer and i pick up a lot of uh body language and I, and I hear things, you know, and, and I think that that also ties into the, the music stuff as well is that, you know, I, I think I have a good ear. Um, and maybe mm -hmm. part of that is it's just listening to, um, you know, different people speak and like it or lump it. Um, dialect is an interesting thing because, uh, um, you, it, it's kind of like, a it's kind of like a card that you're holding that 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 sometimes not all the time but sometimes can expose a lot about a person and um i studied english and theater studies in 
university and uh maybe that's part of it too i'm not sure and just kind of you know really cluing into a lot of that kind of stuff uh completely useless <laughs> things in the real world to uh to be you know uh to, to study by the way kids out there uh don't take english or theater studies i shouldn't i shouldn't say that i learned a lot <laughs> but uh in all practicality uh you know it didn't really do me much good um but uh but you know it, it teaches you how to read and it teaches you how to pick up on certain things and i think uh maybe that's maybe that's part of one of the things that helps me out musically is the fact that i have a good ear and i can hear things and you know uh like i like i was going to say like it or lump it i think if you have a certain if you speak a certain way for example um mm -hmm. It can it can give away a lot of things and there's no hiding that you know you can be the most educated person in the world um but if you uh you know if if you if you don't know how to turn off the gutter speak um you're not going to get taken seriously in certain venues um and and um you know you need to know when to turn on the gutter speak too like when you're in the locker room mm -hmm. you know with, with the guys after the game or whatever there's a certain way you talk when you're talking to your elders or your grandparents or, you know, people of respect, your boss or whatever, there's a certain way you yeah. talk, um, you know, so, so maybe, maybe I just keyed into some of those things naturally. Maybe it was part of my educational experience. I'm not sure, but it is something that I am very uh, aware of. And uh, it's funny that you're not the only person who has mentioned that, like, you don't sound like a maritimer. You know, but there are certain things I do say when I slip into it, you know, particularly when I, you know, say bar, or car or things like that. It's the it's the hard kind of New England AR sound. And, uh, you know, let's go down to the bar. It's not very far, you know, and uh, what are you doing? Oh, my geez, bye. You know, like that kind of thing. And it's like, um, you know, you can slip into it pretty easily. But, uh, you know, I guess I'll take that as a compliment that it doesn't, you know, I don't give all of my cards away when you hear me speak. Excuse me there. <laughs> okay, so um, you spent you've uh, you spent uh, quite a bit of time in Nova Scotia, uh, yep. at, at least twenty years. Yeah, well, I moved to Ontario in uh, I guess officially officially uh, in two thousand six. You know, I, I used to frequent up here quite a bit with um, you know musical projects and things like that, and visiting friends and what have you. And uh, and yeah, I, I officially relocated in two thousand six. Okay, and then from there, um, okay, so you played with you you played with Dartmouth mm -hmm. and, and District for quite a yeah. while. Then you eventually ended up with Hal with Halifax Police, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, they became the seventy eighth Highlanders Halifax Citadel. How did that yeah, happen? Yeah. It was a bit of a process. Um, so the first number of years that I was in the band, it was the Halifax Halifax Police Association. We were in grade two. Right. We were a powerhouse in grade two, uh, and uh, just really, really, I, I don't mind saying we just absolutely were like untouchable, decimated. Every every band we touched. Um, the, early, the the latter days in grade two, there uh, the band was quite a force, and playing really great music. Um, and then eventually, <coughs> pardon me, sorry, I'm getting over a head cold, uh, the March break head cold. Um, uh, eventually, we we were upgraded to grade one. And, uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, there was a bit of a shift in, you know, just the regional, the municipalities back home and how they were kind of, right. as they tend to do, they kind of amalgamate. And Halifax Police Association was no longer. We were now known as the Halifax Regional Police Services Pipe Band. And like a lot of things, um, a couple of years into that, um, and, you know, we, we, we had gone through some different leadership uh, personnel and what, what have you. John Walsh at that point was uh, was our new pipe major who had taken over from the uh, um, uh, uh, Doug Boyd prior to that. Uh, and both great guys still got a lot of time for both of those guys. Just massive, awesome, cool dudes. Um, and uh, anyway, John Walsh was leading the band at this point, and it was now the Halifax uh regional municipality uh you know the area where where this you know the city of dartmouth and halifax and bedford were now known as the right. halifax regional municipality and uh so slight name change there and then of course like a lot of things we just kind of there just wasn't a lot of funding 
And what was once kind of like a pretty, uh, pretty good deal that we had with the Halifax Police Association, um, you know, essentially was drying up. And, uh, and it's a common thing that happens with a lot of bands still to this day. And right. uh, I've been a victim of it a couple of times. And uh, anyway, <laughs> so, you know, we were kind of on the hunt for, for I guess, new sponsorship. And okay. it seemed like a very um, natural progression to have the Halifax Citadel, which is the big national historic site out there, um, which is very closely tied in with the whole kind of Highland culture and the, you know, the, right, the, uh, right. the British Army influence and whatnot in the history of the city. Um, for a ton of reasons, which I won't bother boring you and going into, but it just seemed like a good fit. And, uh, you know, again, right. uh, to put it mildly, slightly deeper pockets. Um, and so they were able to help out and eventually come, I think 2001, uh, you know, it was official that the, you know, a kind of rebranding of the band, new uniforms, new name, same unit um just uh you know new sponsorship new name new uniforms so we kind of tied in and, and of course ever since then it's been associated with the um the halifax citadel uh yeah so it, it was an interesting time because of course you know i was still playing in that band at the time and of course uh the name change uh was pretty contentious for obvious reasons uh that number 78 um was already taken mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the funny thing about it was I, I will go on record as saying i was not a fan of the name change at the time even though i worked right. at the time i did actually work at the halifax citadel i was a i was a a drill instructor at the halifax citadel and i worked there for many years um and uh that was a you know certainly great great experiences um but i was not a fan of incorporating the number 78 into the name change and basically we voted on it and the voting was by a slim margin to go with that name and uh, uh so yeah. how do they okay so we know about the the 78 fraser highlanders right, right. Now how how exact so how are the 78 highlanders different from the 78 frasers other than uh, it mentions Fraser. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, they don't. Uh, one doesn't actually mention Fraser. Uh, one is a Fraser. Right. So really it comes down to a historical thing. Um, so the 78th Fraser Highlanders uh, took the name from, uh, you know, essentially, you know, uh, got permission to use the name um, as a kind of homage to the um, to the Highland Regiment that was raised essentially for in the Napoleonic period uh, for the essentially for the colonial wars. Um, and they largely only saw service in uh, North America. Uh, so, you know, Plains of Abraham, for example. Um, and after that campaign, mm -hmm. that regiment was uh, quickly disbanded. Many of those uh, soldiers that served, you know, um, with distinction in that regiment. It was actually commonplace, not just that regiment, but many of the many soldiers who served in British Army regiments, if they basically saw their their enlistment through and had a good record, one of the things that often happened is that they were given land grants to settle in, you know, one of the colonies. So obviously, that's right. where you got a lot of ex, um, you know. British Army and you know High Highland soldiers who fought in the British Army uh, settling in areas of like you know Nova Scotia and Cape Breton and and uh, and the Highlands of Nova Scotia and uh, in through New Brunswick and Ontario and and beyond you know like anything they landed on the east and some of them stayed and some of them kept moving west you know so this was a common practice and this this happened uh, uh, you know throughout the 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 once huge, glorious British Empire, right? Um, yes. the, especially in the Victorian era. Um, now, so that regiment was raised in the 1700s, late 1700s. Um, yes. If I'm not mistaken, I might have my, my dates a little bit wrong. But anyway, about a, a hundred years later, uh, basically the way the numbering system worked in British infantry regiments is that when a new regiment was raised, oftentimes it was... Uh, you know, the wish of a nobleman who had a uh, fat purse who wanted to uh, raise a new regiment for some kind of campaign and and fund the regiment and it would bear his name, you know, uh, and uh, and he would outfit the regiment in uniform and whatnot and they would fight for the British, you know, for the British Army. 
Um, the way the numbering system in a nutshell, the way it worked down is that, you know, you had so many regiments, uh, of the line or infantry regiments. And if a new regiment happened to be raised and there was a number vacant, let's just say it was the number 86 and it just so happened to be the, you know, a vacant number. And, uh, you know, the, the Duke of, the Duke of, uh, Rothsay is, uh, is, uh, is, wants to raise a regiment and they call it Rothsay's Highlanders. You're now known as the 86th Regiment of Foot, Rothsay's Highlanders. So it just so happened out of a weird coincidence that when the, uh, when Sir Francis Humberston Mackenzie in 1793 wanted to raise another, just so happens Highland Regiment, um, uh, the recruiting area was basically up near the the highlands of scotland in uh, ross and cromarty and and uh and the regiment was uh was raised in inverness and uh, just so happened out of a freak coincidence that 78 was the number assigned there were actually two regiments mm -hmm. raised that year the 78th regiment of foot also known as the ross shire buffs which is the regiment associated with the halifax citadel ross shire because a lot of the recruiting right. area was from from ross um, and uh, buffs because of the facing colors on their uniforms were, were buff color or like a cream color, off-white wow. color. Rothshire buffs, 78th Highland okay. Regiment of Foot, Rothshire buffs. Um, and uh, just so happened that the same year, the 79th Cameron Highlanders were also raised. So two famous regiments, the, the 78th uh, Highlanders, also kind of known as the Seaforth Highlanders, because they were the Mackenzie Military Tartan, uh, which is also very closely associated with the, you know, the Earl of Seaforth. Sir Francis Humberston okay. Mackenzie was the, you know, the, the Earl of Seaforth. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the military Mackenzie, which a lot of people are, you know, are very well acquainted with the Mackenzie Tartan, beautiful Tartan. That's what they wore. Uh, they yeah. were a Highland regiment. So they were, did wear kilts, not Tartan trues. And uh, yeah, they, they, they had quite a successful stint as a regiment in the British army and, and, won a number of uh, Victoria crosses in the, uh, you know, Indian mutiny, for example, in the 1850s, they never saw service in like uh, the Crimean or anything like that. But uh, their, their, their big yeah. deal was in the, in the Indian mutiny. And they won, I think five, five VCs in that campaign alone. So yeah, they were kind of a big deal. They, they, they kept some butt for sure. <laughs> but then again, they, they were disbanded over the course of, uh, you know, many, many years later as, as, uh, natural downsizing in the in the uh in the british army was going on and they were eventually amalgamated into um you know a bunch of other regiments and essentially the the modern day um uh um identity of that regiment now exists in the in the the you know the uh, the the scottish uh, regiments um you know that that uh, that you see up in um you know the different battalions. Uh, they actually, I think, maintain their their a little bit of their own identity by like the, the different numbered, uh, um, you know, one one and two and three Scots, for example, the Scots regiments, um, and you know their old throwback is like the Argyles or the the, the Cameron uh, Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders, that kind of thing, uh, or the the Black Watch and and so on. So I mean, it it can get very confusing, but that's that's the very quick in a nutshell history lesson. So two separate regiments just so happen they have the same number, but you can imagine, you know, right. if you're not really up on the history, it's tremendously confusing for a lot of people. And, and the, and the real confusing part was, especially with a new grade one band entering into the fray and an already established legendary, also Canadian pipe band that already had the pedigree, the 78th Fraser Highlanders who had, had already been yes. there and done the business and were at that time still kind of in a, a you know, in, in the, the top echelon of grade one bands. Um, I think so it ruffled a lot we, of feathers. <laughs> you ruffled a lot of feathers. Go on. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think the name change ruffled a lot of feathers and, uh, and, you know, quite honestly, rightfully so. <laughs> You know, yeah. I think I think the Frasers at yeah, the time. Well, it's funny like that we're trying to ride their coattails a little bit. You know, of course, of course. So that so now we now we segue from one seventy eighth into another seventy eighth. Yeah, and you were recruited by a legendary pipe major mm -hmm. to hook up with the seventy eighth Fraser Highlanders. How did that happen? 
Well, I mean, again, I think it was probably because I played under John Walsh for a number of years uh, in the Halifax band. We'll just call them the Halifax band. Um, and okay. uh, got, to know, got to know him very well. And uh, obviously, I knew who he was. Uh, I, I knew his... Um, I knew his background, obviously, and I knew he was one of the big guys coming from, um, you know, from from the the seventy eighth Frasers. And uh, when he played with us mm -hmm. in Halifax, it was uh, it was a really 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 great time, and definitely took us, you know, we gradually kind of you know got taken a little bit more seriously. Uh, not n speaking no ill will to, towards uh, Doug Boyd at all. I mean, he really did a massive job and really took that band uh, to the top of grade two and into grade one. But having someone like John Walsh come aboard with his pedigree again was just a huge thing. And uh, so after the two, 2001 season and after our trip uh, overseas to, which by then would have been our second trip as a grade one band over to the Worlds, um, I, I guess I was just kind of feeling a little bit of burnt, burnout. You know, I had been playing in pipe bands for quite some time since I was a kid yes. and, you know, no summers off or anything. And, and uh, at that time, of course, too, I was playing in a, in a, in a rock band that was kind of, you know, starting to cause a little bit of waves and it was looking like we were maybe going to do something. And so I really kind of wanted to concentrate a little bit more time on that kind of stuff. And uh, so right. I did for, for two years and then <laughs> out of the blue, my phone rang one day and it was John Walsh and uh, you know, it was obviously lovely to hear from him, but it was just, you know, I did, I had a feeling like something, something's up here. And, uh, yeah. and uh, sure enough, I had, I had heard the rumors floating around at that time, maybe about a week or so before, like a matter of days before I got the call. And uh, I had heard that Haas, uh, Craig Cahoon had, had left the Frasers, right. which was, you know, as a bass drummer, like that's big news. That's big news. Another, another well-known guy, well-known, a, a big personality, shall they, shall we say, uh, in, in the scene. And, um, and so that was definitely big news because the Frasers at the time were still like at the, you know, in the top of their game, they were still a consistent, uh, consistently in the prizes at the worlds. And they were always putting out a great, great, uh, great product, great music and a great percussion section. And uh, mm -hmm. so that was a big deal. And so basically to get the call from John Walsh and basically be asked like, hey, like, listen, you may have heard that this is what's going on and we need a bass drummer and we need somebody you can step in and like, we need, like, it's, it's not just like a fill in kind of thing. We need somebody who's gonna be able to like step on in, keep us at this level and and make it's it their own. And you're the guy. Like essentially that's like how it was pitched to me, you know, like a lot of people w were being talked about and you're, you're the one name that kept coming up. So I was like, man, okay, great. How do we make this happen? And it was really just like that. And at the time, of course, I was still living in Halifax and it was kind of like, I have no idea how this is going to work, but let's make it work. We have to, like, I just, I just knew that this was my shot to get kind of back in the game and get on in back on in at a really high level. And, um, yeah, so I took that opportunity, and two years later, I moved to Ontario. <laughs> and then, yeah. uh, so then, uh, you kept doing that until 2017. That's right. Yeah, I played for 14 seasons uh, in that band. Right. Um, I did miss the 2005 season because, uh, much like you were <laughs> talking about in your your intro, uh, I had I had a yes. bad back injury. Yeah, I had a bad back injury in 2005, and and unfortunately had to miss. I had to step out just prior to the start of the contest season, uh, which was a real drag, you know, because I did all the work and stuff like that in the off season. But um, oh, yeah. so be it. And then, um, a good, uh, uh, just a gem of a human being, Bob Hartlieb, stepped in uh, last minute at the eleventh hour to kind of save the band and, and salvage their season. They still did very well overseas. I think they were still sixth that That's year at the world. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so kudos to him. Hat hat off to Bob Hartley for sure. Um, I'm, I don't think nearly enough people give that guy credit, but he saved the band's butt that year. Um, and unfortunately, I missed that that season. But you know, aside from that, you know, I'm still in the band. But uh, yeah, so for 14 seasons and uh, you know, ups and downs and plenty of in betweens. Uh, lots of championships, lots right. of drumming prizes, lots of uh, ensemble prizes, which was of course my. Of course. For me, as a bass drummer, you know, it's all about ensemble. Um, so 
Uh, but there was some, yes, there was some pretty down times too. A lot of like lean years where we had to, you know, I think we probably rebuilt that band at least three times in my tenure there. And it was, yeah, it was difficult at times, but there was also a, a really exceptionally good run. And to play under Bill Livingston, obviously, I mean, uh, fitting because it's his birthday today. So happy birthday, Bill, if you see this, um, you know, happy birthday, uh, Bill. Like the guy's a legend, obviously one of the yeah, greats, absolutely. one of the greats of all time, and and uh, to play on with so many, so many awesome personalities and uh, and amazing musicians, you know, um, like it was really, there was a lot of good times for sure. Not to not to, you know, not to dwell on on the <laughs> the low times, but that's life. It's all about right. ups and downs and peaks and valleys. Oh. Uh, but that run in particular between 2006 to like 2009. 2009 things kind of started to fall off the rails a bit um but that mm -hmm. time in particular was really really great and of course you know we, we we did the business in 2007. right so uh what so what made you decide that uh you had enough in 27 well what was was it that you had enough in 2017 or was it that they had enough of you <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I, I will say, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it's the kind of stuff that I really want to talk too much about on, on a forum like this, to be honest with you. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, it, so it is sometimes unfortunate how things, uh, end, you know, and, uh, and sometimes decisions are made, um, yeah. and, and, things happen, you know, uh, and, and, uh, I will say there's, there's a lot of stuff that went down that, uh, that happened in that 2017 season that a lot of people just don't know about. Um, and they may, they may never know about what really happened. Um, well, probably better not to but, talk about it then. Yeah. Yeah. But it, you know what? It's one of those things it's behind me. It's behind them. Mm -hmm. The band has obviously gone on, uh, and, gone through many bass drummers <laughs> since yes uh, yes i've you know I can't, uh, I... but and and i've moved on to and you know what to to a certain extent um i think life is too short to be constantly looking over your shoulder and and worrying about who you're going to run into and what conversations are going to be said and who's going to you know uh i will say for for a, for a good long time a good long time after that happened um there was a lot of there's a lot of sour grapes and and bad feelings um but you know uh i think to a certain extent a lot of us have you know to on at least a level have put yeah. some of it behind us and uh you know i listen i will never I, I i never wish any ill will towards anybody and um i got a lot of respect for all the people in that organization and, and anyone that i played with and um uh, and um you know uh, I, yeah you know at the end of the day I we did some pretty great stuff together and that's pretty awesome so you know I, I i choose nowadays like i choose to 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 really uh think about all the good times and stuff like that and uh again life is too short to be to be worrying about all that silly stuff you know it happened and that's you know, yeah you know, i went through this a couple times myself and you know it, it you know for the i guess for the first year or two you're away from the band it, it gets awkward because mm -hmm. you don't know how you're going to talk to anybody mm -hmm. um you don't know um you don't even know how they're how they're really looking at you so yeah so you know yeah i mean for uh first couple times i i ran into previous members of a bands that i've left you know mm -hmm. it's it's been a bit awkward for me and yeah. and yes i'll admit i had sour grapes about certain uh, certain situations so how to get past them especially when you're a bass drummer because you know i think i think we are a very unique we're we are in a very unique position because you know we uh we do actually play with a bit of emotion to it because bass drumming is not just about whether or not you're on time it's 
getting certain tones out of it and getting, you know, cutting to to the spirit of the music itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's uh, there's players that kind of tick the boxes and hit all the big black notes, you know, and kind of uh, um, you know fulfill the the. Uh, pardon the pun, but fulfill the, you know, the base quota of things you need to do to be a bass drummer. Um, but I think it's something extra special when you're a player that is able to really bring the uh, human element into it and play from the heart and really, uh, you know, there's been a number of great players who have been able to do that and transform uh, the sound of a band and, and carry, you know, what, what they, what, what they're able to do and, 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 and make the band sound better because of what they bring to the table. Um, you know, I could list a rattle off a number of names of legends in the game. Uh, some of them are sadly no longer with us. Um, yeah, but you know, some of some of them are still kicking around. And and uh, anyway, uh, you know, I I really do feel I I don't think that it's um, a stretch for me to say, and I don't think I'm, I'm sounding big headed when I say that I think I was kind of one of those uh, type of players that I, I inject, I was able to inject a little, you know, bring something to the to the operation. And, um, you know, I will be honest with you, and it certainly is not a slight to anybody. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, uh, I think, after I left the Frasers, I, I, I quite honestly, I think they've been kind of struggling a little bit to 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 fully patch that hole. Um, it just hasn't quite been the same. Now, again, take that as you will. Anyone hearing this, uh, please don't think that I'm full of myself. It's not that, but um, I, I really do think that I just well. brought a different element to the table. Um, however, you know, again, things happen the way they happen. And um, like I said, um, I did, I, you know, I lost a lot of friends over that deal. Uh, I had a lot of people who I was quite close with who I just never heard from instantly for five years, <laughs> you know. Um, and I can imagine. And a I lot can of completely us, too. You know, and that and that hurts. That hurts a person, you know. When you when you've when you've oh, been in an organization absolutely. and you've literally uprooted yourself and moved to a different pro province, largely because of that band and that organization, and you've definitely been an instrumental yes. part in, you know, in in the history of that band to just be kind of cut loose like that and uh, and hurt. It definitely hurt me a lot. Um, but again, as I say, I think uh, you know some stuff went down this mm -hmm. past summer. There was a former member of the band who passed away, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, another another victim of that horrible disease called cancer. Um, and uh, and there was a number of us at that funeral. And to make, you know, to not again, not to get into it too much, but it was probably the first time that, right. um, you know, many of us uh, who were involved in that whole thing kind of were, were at one spot at one time. And, uh, you know, you kind of you had to face the face the demons kind of thing, you know. And um, there was a lot of good discussion and there was a lot of hugs and uh, handshakes and uh, we left on pretty good terms. So that's, that is a good thing. You know, it's like, I think it's important, like you can't forget when something like that happens to you, you can never forget what happened. But at the same point, mm -hmm. you also need to be a bigger person and just move on because it's, it's in the past and nothing can change that you know so it's life again life yeah. is too short the one really great thing uh that came about b because of that was of course it gave me the opportunity to play in another really great band which was uh dalco triumph street yeah and you know the irony is is that without that terrible situation happening and like I, you know i will say i wasn't planning on leaving the frasers i didn't want to leave the band uh mm -hmm. as far as i was concerned that was going to be I was going to be it for me. I was going to retire in that band, you know, from playing. Um, but, right. you know, you know the, the decision was kind of made for me. Um, but uh, without that happening, I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity uh, and that phone call from David Hilder, uh, Pipe Major David Hilder and, and his lovely wife, Shauna, wow. who ran um, Dalco. And um, what a great experience that was. So uh, I wish that, that would have lasted good. longer. I bet it was. You know? Yeah. 
and and you were there for the last year that they were in existence. Yeah, that's right, 2018. So, um, and it was a pretty good year. We ma- we made it overseas twice. We finished in the top ten at uh, the uh, UK Championships that year, which were in Belfast, and that was a great trip. Right. Um, too bad we probably could have been a little bit uh, figure a little bit higher in the prizes, but our uh, you know unfortunately our, our ensemble and our drumming. Uh, scores kind of brought us down a little bit and uh, we finished I think 10th uh, overall but uh, you know we had a couple of top eight piping finishes which would have been you know I mean that would have been massive to be in that top eight playing against all those huge bands and it was a great trip and an awesome contest and uh, and then of course uh, we made it through the uh, qualifying round at the Worlds again and uh, you know unfortunately again finished a little bit down I think we were last uh, in the overall in the uh, in the final but uh to make it through that qualifying round um you know <laughs> anyone who's done it they they know you know they know it's that is not easy to do and um yeah again and you were a little, disappointed, a little disappointed with the overall result but uh you know we made it through and we're still able to hold our heads high knowing that we were one of the you know 13 top grade one bands in the in the world you know well, so you've been in scotland so uh several times yeah a bunch of times yeah yeah yeah. Um, and I dearly miss it. Um, you know, I haven't gone over obviously for a few years because of COVID, but, uh, yes. you know, uh, being bandedless, um, uh, which is funny. My wife actually has family over there. So we used to kind of work a little bit of a, you know, uh, like a family vacation into it too, after world's right. time, you know, and, uh, her people are all, uh, on the, uh, East coast in St. Andrews. So, um, so it's lovely to get over there, but, uh, yeah, we haven't been over in, well, we haven't been over since 2018. So I miss it a lot. And, uh, you know, I mean, who knows when we'll get back over again. I doubt it will be in a musical capacity. Sadly, I think it'll just be, yes. you know, us going over to visit, um, because there just aren't, there just aren't any band opportunities for me, sadly. So, um, so now you're, you're judging, uh, yep. you're judging uh, midsection mm-hmm. and how long have you been judging for? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it's been a, f- been a number of years now. Um, but you know, again, just kind of by the nature of how things work, um, some contests have, bass and tenor events for solos, uh, some don't. And of course, uh, we right. are not uh, allowed <laughs> yet to be part of judging panels for bands or anything. I really hope that happens in my lifetime. Um, I hope that we eventually see good people from bass and tenor backgrounds who uh, are able to take part in judging ensemble, for example, I think probably yeah. arguably we were some of the yeah. best people for the job. Um, I agree. You know, but who knows if that's ever going to happen. Uh, I would certainly love to, man, I would love to be one of those people uh, and, and, you know, be able to, you know, like judge some of those big contests in a, in an ensemble capacity or something. Um, who knows? Mm-hmm. Maybe that'll be the next kind of area that I'd make my mark in. I, you know, who knows, but it's really hard. It's really hard. There's still this kind of, this real kind of, uh, uh, I don't want to say a hatred, but I think there's a, there's a real, there's a real kind of like. Disdain. Ancient, well, like it's just like an ancient way of thinking, you know, that, that bass and tenor drummers, you know, we're not real musicians or anything. Um, now that could um, be said for some of us, for sure. <laughs> um, that's arguable. You know, that is extreme. I would say that it's, ex- that is extremely arguable. I mean, not just well, anybody can play a bass drum, not just anybody can play a tenor drum. And there's a lot of technique that goes into it. You're, you and you're, I know you're that. Right. You're, you're right. But I guess my point is, is that the sections still do, um, allow a lot of riders um and and uh there's still a lot of people who who get away with hiding there's it might it might shock you it might not i don't know uh but it it, a lot of people might be surprised how many tenor drummers i work with for example who Mm -hmm. 
just don't know the mechanics of drumming. They just couldn't play a double right. stroke roll to save their life, or they've just never been able to play, or they couldn't tell you what a paradiddle is, or, you know, they wouldn't even be able to take apart their own right. drum and put it back together. You know, these well, are these are basic well, things. And I think this is- A drummer would understand a paradiddle. Well, you know, even on that level too, I think there's probably would a lot of- a more than- we, We've gotten into this kind of era for, for uh, you know, maybe, a decade or so um, where I think people have been rushed through a little bit too much. And it's like, get out there and compete and learn some flourishing and look really cool. Mm -hmm. But right. they're not really taught how to actually play the instrument. And, and the only way you're going to get yes. that is to take, is to take some degree of, of snare drumming lessons. You need to have, I'm a big, big proponent of you have to have some basic language skills um, to be able to put those phrases together and to communicate that language. And the more skills that you have, uh, the better of an understanding that you have on the basic mechanics of drumming, uh, the more that's right. going to help you in the bass and tenor section. You know, I, I started off as a snare drummer. I played for many years, uh, you know, as a snare drummer. And um, and obviously I do right. a lot of kit playing now. Um, but um the people who have worked on that and the players that I, uh, that I've played with who have worked on that and other players I know from other bands who have worked on that, you can tell the difference. Absolutely. And you can, the people who have not done that work, certainly to me and to anyone of, uh, to anyone who knows, uh, well, you know, they'll stick out like a sore thumb. I listen, I played with a lot of people, you know, I won't mention names, but I, I I've played with people who just, you know, we we're constantly trying to find ways to kind of like bury them in the mix, so to speak, to, to right. because they just couldn't pull off some of the more complicated stuff. And and luckily, if you're in a big section, for example, like some of the sections tend to be now, I'm not always a huge fan of that either, by the way. Um, but, you know, with how massive some of these tenor sections are getting, for example, you know, you can you can kind of hide the weaker players. Um but to me, there's nothing more badass than if you can have, you know, a, a group of players in, in a bass and tenor section who all can pull off really cool tricks and licks and, uh, and, right. and, yeah. and again, use that to your advantage on those two, three or four spots in a medley where you can really step into that limelight a bit and then step back out, you know, right. we're, we're there to support, yeah, you, gotta... we're, you know, right. we're not so there to and, and get yeah. them on time. Yeah. Yeah, and and, 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 and I mean, not just anybody work on that, that. You know, you need to work on that stuff. And and the bottom line is, I guarantee you, uh, a lot of sections just don't. They're more, they're more um, focused on you know, looking good. That's a that is a part of it. I, I I'm not certainly not saying you know don't look slovenly and don't look the part. Um, but uh, when I say look good, I'm talking more about the, the visual aspects right. as opposed to playing aspects. And um, it, it's painfully obvious to me, just even talking mm -hmm. to some people, you'd, you'd probably be shocked at the number of people that play it. You know, very upper echelon, yeah. grade two and grade one bands uh, from those bass and tenor sections right. that just really don't know how to play drums. I hear you. I hear you. And so, you know, now, so I'm trying now to that we've that. gone to that point. <laughs> <laughs> hey, not a problem. So now we've come to a point in which we now have only five grade one bands in all of North America. Mm -hmm. At least about six years ago in Ontario, we had three. Three of them. Yeah. 73s are Highlanders, Toronto Police, Peel Police. And 2017, Peel Police were downgraded. That same year, Toronto Police fell apart. It seems as if the higher the level of the band, the more likely it is it's going to collapse at some point. How do you overcome that when you are that high of a level? How do you keep that level? 
Uh, I don't know. I don't have the answers for sure. Uh, I will say that I, it's really sad to see what's happening in Ontario, um, in Canada, to be quite honest. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I will tell you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really uh, hot shot players, you know, just speaking locally, uh, I say locally, um, you know, let's yeah. say in the Ontario area. Um, right. Who are we've in got talent. Right now. Yeah. And, and, and they just, we, we've got talent. For whatever, for whatever reason, they don't want to play in whatever bands are out there right now. Um, I think some people are just tired of, of, you know, of, of some of the, unfortunately, some of the, uh, the, the excess baggage that comes along with playing in uh, a band or a certain band. I don't know, but we're also of the area era too, uh, where, you know, we see a lot of players that if they're really serious about playing and they're willing to put, you know, quite literally put their money where their mouth is, um, they'll travel to go play somewhere. Um, right. You know, if I was given the opportunity, I would do that. Uh, but, uh, but it's a little different as a bass drummer because, you know, uh, uh, bands really want that anchor there like every week, you know, so it's Absolutely. a lot harder to every be a flying. Yeah. It, it's really, it's, it's really, you would, you'd have to have a really, not only a special person that can, do that pull that off and do the work at home and then show up and and have everything off seamless but you also have to have the trust in that organization and the leadership in that organization that they're gonna believe in you um and the, the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of bands you know i think if i lived overseas like i'd be well hooked up with a band by now um but um the fact of the matter is is that i think a lot of bands and again i'm probably <laughs> some people might not like to hear this um, but one thing with me I is that I will, always, I, I will always, uh, you know, Hey, you know what, if you don't want the truth, sometimes don't ask, you know what I mean? I'm, I'll give it to you straight. Um, but, um, and it ruffles feathers sometimes, but it's the truth. Um, I think a lot of bands would right. rather settle for, uh, a mediocre player who can be there every week, uh, versus like a, a top shelf, you know, kind of like. Uh, you know, all-star player who can only be there at certain times, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, that so that, that, that's, that's, that's more about, you know, that's more about my situation, but um, I had to fix it. I don't know. I, it, you know what? There's a lot of things going on here in Ontario, it seems. Uh, well, not just here in Ontario, but I mean, there's just a lot of wacky right. stuff going on and, and, and um, it, it's sad, you know, for example, we had the, um, you know, the Agnew Harrison drumming contest was recently canceled, um, which I was invited to, and I was very much looking forward to trying to put something together and, and, and you know, go play against some of the, the best hot shots around. And, and I was really looking forward to that. And it got canceled because people just couldn't commit or didn't want to commit to coming out. Um, or, or maybe even worse, they just never responded. You know, and just left the organizers kind of just hanging and going, well, what the hell? Like, you know, we, we got to make a decision here, guys. Like, let us know. Yeah. Um, that stuff bugs me because, you know, as a bass and tenor player, and, and I guess to a certain extent, the same goes for, you know, pipers and snare drummers, too. Um, you know, you, you can't just complain and not be part of the solution, you know, Uh so get your asses out yes. and play in solo contests. Get out and, and and get lessons and get better. If you're serious about it, do something about it and stop, you know, and, and, and then maybe you can open your mouth and complain a little bit because you're actually doing something. But it's so much of the time I find is people yak, yak, yakking and talking the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And this is what really, really grates it's me is scary. that... You know, you got to be part of the solution and get out and play. But I guarantee you, um, it's a lack of willingness to invest. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, and I and I just don't get it. You know, like all I can say is I've done my part. You know, I've done my part. I competed in all the online solos. I won champion supreme in the online contest for two, 
2021. I played in the shots online contest. I won that thing. I played in the McMillan online contest. I won that thing. Um, every chance I had to play, I did because I could do it from the comfort of my own home. And, you know, I could send my best take in, you know what I mean? And it was just, I could put my, literally my best performance forward. And it was an opportunity to play in front of some of these judges, like from overseas and stuff that you wouldn't normally get a chance to. And, and, you know, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but for me, I was, I was shocked at how many, or at how few people entered those contests. And what that says to me, quite frankly, is that one or a combination of things were going on they're just they just weren't interested which to me is kind of like what a shame or they weren't prepared which tells me that they just when COVID hit people were just like okay vacation time and they just like chucked the sticks in the corner and didn't stay on top of their craft right or they were lazy and just didn't didn't do the work or they were scared they were scared to get beat in an online contest because you can put your best performance forward and one or a combination of all those things. And I've said that to people and, you know, kudos to the people who did step up and play some of the contests. Um, anyone who's watching right, this, right. you're one of those people, you know who you are and you know that I appreciate that. But there was a hell of a lot of people who should have been out there competing um, who just didn't and but you know it's always the same old excuses you know oh i had other stuff going on or just i was too busy and i was just like you think i'm not busy had to be you know (laughs) fish like you know come on give me a break man i made the time because it means something and you know what i think the people and the organizers from the ppbso realize that and they should be commended for making that happen you know all of the people behind the scenes that you don't always hear about and you know um you know the leadership and the and the and the, and all the people working to make all these contests and stuff happen. Again, those people know who yes. they are, and and I think that was awesome that they, you know, it, it took them a year. The first year of the pandemic was a little crazy. Uh, everyone was playing catch up, but you know, by year two, when we started yeah. seeing more of these online contests. I think that was really good, and all of the players who stepped up to play in those pipe pipers or snare drummers or or bass and tenor players. Right. Again, there weren't a lot of the bass and tenor players, but those who did step up, you know, um, I commend you. But we need to see more of that, and I and I guarantee you, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be a, a pessimist, but um, I would not be too uh, shocked if the two contests that I am judging at this summer, uh, if you know, if I if I end up judging in Fergus, and I only ha- you know, I, and I sit there and I watch like you know, five competitors. It's not going to shock me too much because people just don't seem to want to come out. And then when events get canceled, they're the first ones to complain, you know? Right. I don't know. How are we ever going to get taken seriously enough that we'll yeah, eventually yeah, yeah. put on judging panels if we can't even support our own contests, you know? I don't know. True. True. But it's a sad state of affairs now, with the bands here for mm-hmm. sure. And, and uh, you know, the, the once – the once mighty Ontario grade grade two and grade one, uh, you know, scene is just a shadow of its former self. And it's really sad. It is very much, yep. very much. And, and it, and it's funny because I've noticed when I've looked through the history of the Ontario circuit and the one observation that I made going through this is that grade two, that's the make or break level. What tends to happen at the grade two level is you you get, you plateau at some certain point, then all of a sudden it just comes crashing down when, when key people start leaving, then other people start leaving. And it's, I've seen this with a lot of bands and the latest one happened police when Billy left the, Grade two lapsed entirely and they never came back. And as a matter of fact, the grade four band collapsed as well because a lot of their key people ended up moving on to the 78 Fraser Highlanders. So I've seen bands Mm -hmm. get up there. Then all of a sudden they get to that point and boom, it happened. And it, this, this is history because it happened with Hamilton police before, before they, before 
they were they got back into grade two with Bob Elliott. They got they they had Don Forgan, I believe, and um, no, it wasn't Don Forgan. Damn it, John Gadet, um, uh, Peter Monier. I forget the name now. For me, P Peter Peter Monier oh, was Monier. Uh, was yeah yes yes yeah yes. It, it, it was in my head as like trying to get it out, get it out. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, Hamilton police collapsed the same way mm -hmm. when Ammonier left. Yeah. I mean, and I don't know. Every... I, I don't know why exactly this seems to always happen. I mean, I, I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that oftentimes bands maybe think that their personnel are going to stick around forever. Uh, and it's going to be like this uh, powerhouse, you know, uh, um, you know, banned for decades and decades and decades. And, but you have to have a feeder system. And I think this is what a lot of the bands are, are realizing now is that you have to put the education in, you have to get into schools, you have to get it, uh, have a good teaching program. You have to be, um, you have to be aligned with, uh, you know, with, um, with a good feeder system. A la, you know, you see some of the bands overseas, mm -hmm. like, like Bog Hall and, and, and whatnot. And they're known for having these uh, SFU even, you know, they, they like, Right, right. Yeah. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to like everything that they do, oh, but no. you gotta, you gotta, gotta give it to them that they have a great feeder system and they always produce the talent. And um, I think it's a weird thing. What happens here is that, like, if if a lower grade band starts struggling and there's some talent from there, um, and and things kind of go belly up, um, everyone, you know, all, everyone starts jumping off the ship and they start swimming for the the next best thing in town or 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 what's close to them and oftentimes it's bands like you know the you know we've got the only grade one band uh you know in the game around here is this is the frasers and so everyone naturally yeah. like they want to play in a grade one band and i don't blame them you know um and and they're all fighting to 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 get over there and and they're not stupid. Like, for, you know, the, the, the leadership of that band, like if, if people are coming out and they'll be like, yeah, if you're interested, come on out. Of course, we'll take you. But what it does is it really depletes everything else around you. Um, and Absolutely. so I think even, you know, again, it's been a few years since I've been in that organization. But I think, you know, even the Frasers realized the importance of kind of uh, having some type of feeder system. And I think, you know, uh, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I, I would not be surprised if they've if they've you know, made, made moves to kind of align themselves with uh, other lower grade bands to try and you know, kind of help each other out, provide teaching, maybe, right, or, right. Or, you know, tuition to some of the lower grade bands. And in, in turn, they kind of uh, act as like the, you know, the, the senior band that younger kids or younger players or players that get to a certain level can step up to when they, when they're ready. Um, and they kind of, you know, right. it's a symbiotic relationship, you know, but certainly the scene here is a shadow of its former self. I mean, my goodness, I can remember, you know, as a kid coming up here to Ontario and competing, you know, in Maxville and stuff. And it was like the one time, you know, <laughs> years before the, in the internet, you know, and YouTube and everything, um, uh, that dates my age right uh you know but like yes. we'd, we'd get it we'd get up to maxville and montreal and stuff like that and we'd get a, a like a real live chance to see saint thomas police or the 78th fraser highlanders or or you know uh, toronto district or you know all these great bands who were still at that time like going overseas and and kicking butt you know and like we could go see them in person and see these people play and and uh, and soak it in like a sponge and there was so much talent from here and then it just seems to have just kind of really dried up you know um yes and that's why i say like that year in with the frasers like 2009 that was kind of like when things started kind of going off the rails a bit um and that was a real heartbreaker for us because if i'm not mistaken i think we won the drumming in our qualifying heat and you know our pipers just had a really bad run you know and it happens like i'm not you know i'm not like dumping on the pipe core or anything like that but i think right, they right, knew yeah. it at the time and and certainly we knew it because we never made it through and like when you think like in a two-year span you go from finishing fourth overall and winning the drumming to mm -hmm. uh not even making it out of the qualifier and that was kind of like the beginning of a kind of a long 
you know, down period for that yeah. band. And, uh, and, you know, to be quite honest with you, like, um, it's a much different band now, much different personnel. Um, you know, some, some of the old dogs are still there for sure, but, um, right completely all new people and it's a whole different kind of sound uh different kind of identity uh and um it's a lot lot different from when even when i played in there just you know six five six years ago indeed yeah. Yeah. so so i don't know you know i think they're still kind of holding holding steady in the grade but it's like i, I it, it's going to be especially given the standard that's out there now with some of these bands like it's just uh it's going to be really diff like I will say this there's no bad bands in grade one you know there's there's no bad bands in grade one well to even get there is a, is a yeah. is an achievement yeah. in itself yeah but i mean, I mean it'll, it, it'll be very it'll be very difficult for the frasers and other bands obviously i'm, I'm not just yeah. picking you know, i'm not just picking them out um but it'll be it'll be very different d difficult for them to to get back to that level that we were like in 2007 2000 Eight, you know, I think honestly the band sounded better in 2008 than it did in 2007, but that's also mm -hmm. weird how that goes sometimes, you know, um, you know, things happen, yeah. things yeah. happen. Yeah. Like, it's funny because when I well, listen to recordings from 2007, like I, the mistakes just jump out at me and I'm like, oh my God, like what? How did we win? <laughs> how did we win? But, you know, again, I wasn't one of the guys with the, the pens, but, um, you know, I think 2008 was a much better performance personally overall, but you know, that's just me. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for appearing on my show. Um, I'm sure I'll find you somewhere in the circuit because mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm at all the games myself. So uh, I'll be looking forward to meeting you out there. Uh, thanks so much again for uh, appearing totally totally my pleasure thanks for asking me i think you just asked me like a couple of days ago so this all came together pretty quick and and i um, happy that we were able to make it happen and uh i'm staying up a little a little past my bedtime uh and uh i'll have to get back upstairs out of my drum <laughs> den here and go see what my family's up to but uh yeah uh pleasure pleasure thanks for asking me um lucky number three hopefully uh some people uh, get a chance to tune in and um, we'll certainly carry on the conversation uh, when we see each other in person at some point this summer, I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, Looking forward to meet you out there. Also, if I can just do a very quick shameless plug, uh, if anyone is interested oh, yeah. in reaching out, uh, bass you and tenor it. drummers. Yeah. Bass and tenor drummers. Uh, you know, if you're looking to fix technique things or get some tips and tricks on how to better your sound or, um, you know, you just need, uh, you know, uh, a different ear to listen to your solo performances, for example, or something like that. Um, think about reaching on out and let's get a dialogue going. I'd love to hear your stuff and help out where I can. You can, uh, I'm sure find me on Facebook, um, big Johnny Rowe, or just, uh, reach me through, caledonia drum studio dot ca and i'm also on uh yeah you know all the all the platforms in instagram facebook you name right. it so uh yeah by all means reach out and if you see me in person come on up and say hi i'm not uh i'm not scary i promise you can pick my <laughs> brain about anything. well you heard the man caledonia drum studio dot ca if you want, if you want to get some extra tips on how to work on, on your techniques, because there's always refinement required on techniques, especially in pipe band drumming. Talk to Johnny. He's the man. Thanks again, Johnny. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. We'll see you around soon. Right. That was Johnny Rowe. He's the, he's one of our top drummers in the circuit and he's also an adjudicator in the midsection and when i come back i'm going to give you my final thoughts
I wanted to thank Johnny again for appearing on the show. Uh, it's always nice to have people who can uh, share their experiences, share their tips, share their share anything about life in a pipe band because, you know, the more you know, the better. And so I have to say that I am deeply concerned with the Great Wind landscape in North America. There are only five bands competing in the grade one level in North America, and neither of them are close to each other. They're basically on different corners of the continent. And I really don't know what to say anymore. Just the fact that these bands will barely meet each other on a competition field anywhere other than the world's is a cause for great concern. Six years ago, there were three bands, grade one in Ontario. And in British Columbia, there were two. My friend Johnny was one, on, in one of them. And where are they now? In Ontario, the Peel Regional Police was downgraded by the RSPBA. And then Toronto Police fell apart after they lost their lead drummer. In British Col Columbia, the Delco Triumph Pipe fell apart in 2018. Johnny Rowe was a, one of the last guys in the band. And we have, suffice it to say, we have a structural and systemic problem in the grade one level in different associations. It's the ultimate understatement. When you have only one band at one level, is that really competition? When you have only one band competing, I'm inclined to say no. It does not help. It will not prepare them for the world stage. And if these bands do not have anybody to compete against locally, how exactly are they really going to be prepared? How are they going to know? How are they, how will they know how they're going to do when they get to Glasgow? That is the quandary when you only have five Grade one bands in North America. You don't necessarily have to question how many grade one bands there are in the UK. Hey, there's a whole bunch. We already know that. And there are at least three in New Zealand, three grade one bands. We saw that in the New Zealand championships. And in North America, a landmass that could actually fit in five New Zealands. There are only five bands. This is bad news in the grade one landscape. And I am very, very concerned with that. It says to us that we don't have talent among millions and millions of people at this level, but it's, but we know that's not true. We have plenty of talented people. So this points to this systemic and structural problem. Now we already know that the city of Dunedin will be coming to Georgetown, Ontario to give the sub eighth Frasers a run for their money. And I applaud that completely. We need more grade one bands competing each against each other to prepare for that top stage of competition. But at the same time, we need to do the things that need to be done locally. We need to bring the excellence locally. We can't just we can't just pick it up from every, everywhere around the world. We have to build it too. That starts at the grassroots. That starts with you and me. So it brings to question, what are we willing to do to build excellence? Because once again, it's up to us, you and me, right? To foster this level of excellence among our players and to ensure that this kind of talent is nurtured. This talent has the capability and this talent is not lost along the way. It brings us to back to Andrew Burdoff's point. If we want to foster excellence in our pipe band lives, we need to make sure that no one gets left behind for some reason or other. So honestly, I really can't see any North American bands winning the worlds. The competition here needs to improve for that to happen. And we need more, that means we need more grade one bands competing. And where do we get that from? We get that from the grade two level. And these grade two bands need to stay resilient enough to avoid a collapse like other grade two bands before them. 
the the list is big of grade two bands that have collapsed at some point. And yes, the higher the level you are, you're you are always at the verge of collapse. The higher the higher up the ladder you are. But grade two is the critical level for most bands because that is when they tend to collapse. Now, the city of Dunedin is a different story because they did win the Worlds in 2018. But we need to be mindful of the fact that every grade two band is always on the verge of collapse. And it would behoove all five grade one bands in North America to do their part in helping the grade two bands in their neighborhoods to get up there. And in turn, it will help them sharpen them uh, their competition up when they actually do compete to win champion supreme rather than winning it by default competition makes us bit pl better players and that's why we do it we should all be doing our parts in improving our bands to get those with talent ready to step up to the world stage and do us proud if you like this video please like and subscribe to this channel and I hope to have all the results from Durham and Melbourne ready for you over the weekend. In the meantime, keep an eye on this channel for more updates. I'm Renee Goje. Bye for now.